Hello and welcome to this module of the EPA Chala series. My name is Ashwata and I will be conducting this module. I uh, studied at the National Law School of India University, Bangalore, and then completed my master's at the Yale Law School in Connecticut in the US. Um, the segment on comparative constitutional law contains a series of sub subcategories within the realm of constitutional design. These include a variety of different um, areas of law, such as a federalism, uh, the structure of government between presidentialism, parliamentarism, and semi-presidentialism, and the separation of powers. This specific module is in the area of uh, secularism, the separation of religion and the state. The structure of this module is as follows. Uh, it will progress in two parts. The first part will deal with different models of secularism that can be found across constitutions in the world. The second part of this module will just raise some questions about India and about what kind of model, model you can find in India on secularism. Uh, just to begin, the idea of secularism as the separation between the church and the state began as a concept in Europe. It, will, it can be attributed to George Jacob Holyoke in circa 1648. The notion of secularism evolved from two concepts. The first was the ideas that accompanied the French Revolution. And secondly is the rise of utilitarian thought. What is the rationale behind secularism? The reason why secularism was considered important to any state is one, because there was this need to respect reason and a need to abolish superstition and de deference to higher beings that people weren't sure existed. In order to understand the way that this concept has been in incorporated into different constitutions and the manifestation that this concept has taken in, constitu in comparative constitutional law, it's useful to create and use the matrix that Professor Gary Jacobson has employed in his recent publication, The Wheel of Law, which deals with secularism models across the world. Uh, Professor Jacobson creates a two by two table and in creating this table relies on two different important factors. The first factor is what is the official cognizance of religion that a state provides. So in a situation where there is a partial official cognizance, the state would be giving greater weight or cognizance to one religion as against another. This would encompass situations where, for instance, a state has an official religion or an official institution that it regards as being the guiding religious institution of that particular state. A case of impartial official cognizance of religion would be a situation where a state does not have an official religion or doesn't, cogni doesn't provide cognizance to any one religious group. The second factor that Gary Jacobson looks at is the socio-cultural consequences of religion within the given society that's being analyzed. A situation where there is thick social-cultural consequences of religion would be one where religion itself is extremely vital to the fabric of the civil society in question. So religion, religious groups, religious institutions play a large role in the conduct of civil and political life. They influence government policies and they're very prominent within the societal group itself. As against this, there is the conception of thin socio-cultural consequences of religion. In these societies, religion and religious groups, religious institutions do not have a critical influence on the society itself. In relying on these two factors in creating a table, what results is uh, what you see on this slide. You have four alternatives that are created and they can be termed as follows. One is called the visionary model. The second is called the ameliorative model. The third is called the assimilative model. And finally, you have a situation where Professor Jacobson points out that the constitution is not secular at all. But on the other hand, we can extrapolate from this a situation of aggressive secularism, which we will discuss in the future of the, in this module itself. So let's move on to the first model, the visionary model. What characterizes the visionary model of secularism? The visionary model is characterized by partial official cognizance with a thin socio-cultural consequence. What does this mean? This means that in these societies, the state strongly recognizes a specific religion as being fundamental to its existence or being foundational to the state itself. While on the other hand, society doesn't incorporate the role of religion very strongly within its being. So this is called the visionary model because the constitution in these cases seeks to accommodate the aspirations of one specific group and is therefore partial to it and create a space for that particular group within its framework as against any other religious group. 
Are there any examples of this today? One example that is often taken is the case of Greece. Within the constitution of Greece, the Greek Orthodox Church is accorded the status of the prevailing religion within the territory of Greece. This tantamounts to the Greek Orthodox Church, in fact, having the, being the official religious institution of the state itself. However, what, is this, what are the thin socio-cultural consequences of religion in this case? We see the Professor Karigianis, in a recent article in the European Journal of Sociology, has pointed out that despite the existence of a uh, religion, that on, uh, an official religion, the Greek system does not imply incomplete secularism. Why is this the case? It is because for one, there is a growing structural weakness of the Orthodox Church itself, which again feeds into the idea of thin socio-cultural consequences of religion. And secondly, because the church's ideology itself is becoming more tolerant and more secular. And therefore, its religious influence is being on some level tempered. Are there any other examples of visionary secularism? Professor Jacobson in his work points to Israel as another example, which has a model that is akin to the model that we saw in Greece. Israel was of course founded on Zionist aspirations and Zionist aspirations do lie at the heart and the foundation of the state itself. However, Professor Jacobson points out that due to the secular orientation of the Israeli Jew population, there have been certain secular outcomes that have resulted despite the Zionist foundations of the state. These avenues of secularism are created because they do exist despite there being an official religion equal protections for freedom of equal protections for citizens and the idea of freedom of religion within the territory of Israel itself. Uh, the, the examples that can be pointed out are as early as 1922 in article 2 of the British Palestinian mandate freedom of religion was provided to all individuals within the territory and scholars also point to the Israeli declaration of independence which at its foundation also guaranteed the freedom of religion. Now let us move on to the second model that we discussed ameliorative secularism. What does this mean? Within ameliorative secularism, the social order of the state is strongly driven by religious considerations, which means that there are thick socio-cultural consequences of religion within the territory. However, in these situations, the constitution itself is impartial to the idea of religion. Therefore, the constitution acts as a democratizing factor. Why is it called ameliorative secularism? The term is coined because what the constitution seeks to do in these cases by incorporating secularism is to transform a deeply religious society into a uniform polity. If we want to search for examples of this, a good example that people uh, refer to is the case of Canada. Canada follows what is called pluralist accommodation. So on the one hand, if we refer to article 2 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, it states that everybody has the following fundamental freedoms, subsection A, freedom of conscience and religion. Therefore, the freedom of religion is strongly entrenched within the constitution. However, on the other hand, the state does, on, uh, the state of Canada does in certain circumstances positively accommodate certain religious behavior. For instance, section 97 of the British North America Act, which in fact created the dominion of Canada itself allows for taxpayer support of separate Catholic and Protestant schools. Moreover, if we look at a more recent example, within the Manitoba province of Canada itself, the Human Rights Code, the Provincial Human Rights Code, prescribes that reasonable accommodations must be made by the state for religion. What does this mean? It isn't that the state simply dissociates itself with religion altogether, but there is to some degree some certain accommodation that needs to be made by the state for religious groups and for religious principles. Deciding the balance between secular laws and religion has been a challenge for the, the courts of Canada. The judiciary has often struggled with this question. One case in which this, this conflict came to the fore was in a 1985 Supreme Court decision of Bhindar. The facts of Bhindar involved a challenge to a law passed by the Canadian state that required that certain in all individuals had to wear a hard hat in specific circumstances. And it was challenged because an individual in this case was wearing a turban and believed that requiring a hard hat to be worn would violate his freedom of religion. So the question here was how to balance the, the freedom of religion as against the secular law. 
The court upheld the law and the reasoning it provided was that first, this measure was introduced in public interest and in the interests of the safety of individuals. Secondly, it pointed out that this specific law applied to all individuals impartially and wasn't targeted at any particular group. Therefore, in this particular case, it appears that the balance was in favor of that secular legislation as against accommodating religious freedom. This question was revisited by the Canadian Supreme Court in a 1990 decision, Central Alberta Dairy Pool. Here, the ratio of Bhindar was revisited and reconsidered and the court held as follows and I quote, an employer that has not adopted a policy with respect to accommodation and cannot otherwise satisfy the trier of fact that an individual accommodation would result in undue hardship will be required to justify his conduct with respect to the individual complainant. So what does this do and what does it mean? What it has been done by the Supreme Court in this case is that the burden upon the employers has been raised and employers are now required to explain situations of when secular laws are being used to violate the freedom of religion. In order to just wrap up this uh, discussion on Canada, it's important to flag some of the more recent issues that are cropping up that also illustrate this, this perennial struggle that exists in Canada about the idea of secularism, which we can maybe even extrapolate to any constitution that has this sort of model that seeks to accommodate religion. Very recently, uh, there has been a controversy regarding the Quebec Charter of Values and Human Rights being amended to incorporate a more, a more aggressive form of secularism to ban any sort of religious manifestation in public, ban a religious, the wearing of religious garb in um, government offices. In a country that believes in accommodation, this would seem, as an, seem to be an extreme measure. However, debates regarding this amendment are still ongoing and it would be interesting to see what the outcome is. Moving on to the third model, is, this is the assimilative model of secularism. What is the assimilative model characterized by? Assimilative model has thin sociocultural consequence with impartial official cons uh, cognizance. This means that there is an absence of any state support for religious activities of the majority religion or the minority religion in that particular country and there is a corresponding thinness of religion in the social fabric of the nation itself. Why is this called the assimilative model? It's called the assimilative model of secularism because over here political principles have a decisive priority over religious impulses and within the constitutional framework there is a tendency for people to be assimilated into a single, a single uniform polity. A good example of the assimilative model, as we can also see in Professor Jacobson's uh, table, is the case of the United States of America. What does secularism mean within the United States? Reference can be made to answer this question to a comment made by the founding father Jefferson, circa 1800, where he proposed the metaphorical wall of separation between, the religion, between religion and state. This idea was further expounded by courts and reference can be made for further clarity to the decision of the Supreme Court in 1989 in County of Allegheny versus ACLU, where it was held that a secular state in the perspective of the United States of America is one that neither promotes atheism nor has an official religion. So we note that there is the absence, unlike in the case of Canada, of a requirement that certain principles be accommodated, religious principles, practices, beliefs be accommodated actively by the state. What is the law relating to religious freedom in the United States? Within the Bill of Rights, there are two relevant religion clauses. The first is called the Establishment Clause, and it reads that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion. The second is called the Free Exercise Clause, and it continues from the Establishment Clause, and it says that the Congress can't even prohibit the free exercise of religion. We note that, therefore, in the case of the US, in the absence of accommodation, there is still a necessity to guarantee freedom of religion. So what, is there anything problematic about this? Several scholars have criticized the American model for a variety of reasons. It's really useful to make reference to the criticism forwarded by Professor Michael Sandel, who points out that if the United States is interested in preserving the liberty and identity of citizens, and if religion is such a vital part of that identity, then shouldn't there be a more accommodative model of secularism that must be followed by the state? Is it enough that the state of the, if the United States just 
decides to refrain from any sort of interference if it isn't providing adequate protection for the, uh, for the interests of individuals? These are all important questions that can be raised in this context. Not unlike Canada, the judiciary of the United States has also struggled to find a balance between religious freedom and secular laws. Now, the early approach that the Supreme Court took is manifested in the 1963 decision of Sherbert versus Bono. And this resulted in what is popularly known as the Sherbert test that held the ground for many, many years. The law in this case laid down was that any law that burdened the free exercise of religion would not be legally sustainable. What happened was that a strict scrutiny standard was established for a government to sustain any law that impacted the freedom of religion. And further, the government would therefore have to show some sort of compelling interest for that law to be in place in order for the court to hold that the law was not invalid. The Sherbert test was revisited later on in another decision of the US Supreme Court in 1990 called Employment Division versus Smith. The facts in this case concerned a state prohibition of peyote. Peyote is a drug that was used for religious purposes by minority groups within the United States of America. The question was whether this particular ban was legal. In upholding the ban, the court stated that the law that had put, been put into place was a neutral law of general applicability. This means that it wasn't directed against any particular group, but it was a law that applied to all individuals equally by virtue of just being citizens of the United States. Therefore, there was no violation of the Establishment Clause in this particular case. The law of the neutral law of general applicability became the new test that then replaced the Sherbert test. Therefore, it wasn't now the law to show that there was some compelling interest that the government had in limiting religious freedom, but merely that the law that was in place applied universally and generally to all citizens and wasn't directed against a group. The legislature saw certain problems with the formulation of the test in the employment division case. And therefore, it passed the legislation to do away with it. The 1993 Religious Freedom Act, within its text, reinstated a strict scrutiny standard for all laws that limited religious freedom within the United States of America, even if they were laws that were actually of general applicability to all individuals. The Supreme Court later considered this and read its effect down. But what we see from this, from the experience of the United States, is that countries find it very difficult still within their constitutional law jurisprudence to balance the principles of secular law against the principles that of religious freedom. What is the fourth module we spoke about? Aggressive secularism. What does this mean? As against the assimilative model, not just as assimil does aggressive secularism require a separation of religion and state, what it requires is an aggressive separation to the extent that the state must ensure that religion has no role to play or has no manifestation in public places. What is an example of this? The best example of this is the case of the French, of French constitutional law. In as early as 1905, in France, there was a law that separated the religion and state and ended the concept of any state-endorsed religion. We see that this is in stark contrast to other European countries. For instance, Greece that we've already discussed that continues to have a state, a state religion and even against the, the laws in England. Article 1 of the Constitution of France guarantees now a secular state. Of course, it's true that religion, religious freedom is also simultaneously granted by the Constitution of France. Moreover, France is a party to the European human rights jurisprudence, which in Article 9 of the Convention clearly states that religion's freedom and to some extent, the, the right to manifest religion is also part of the fundamental human rights of all people of the European Union. The entire debate on French secularism, which is known as laicite within France, came under fire in, on 15th of March 2004, when President Chirac passed a law that prohibited the use or the, man, the, the use of any religious symbols within the territory of France in public. It came under fire mostly because one significant uh, impact of this was that individuals who wanted to wear religious garb, for instance, the hijab, any other form of headscarf, turbans, couldn't do so within public spaces any longer. The entire move came under a lot of criticism and a, a communication was brought before the Human Rights Committee challenging this law against many of the rights that France has subscribed to under the ICCPR. 
the challenge was brought by an individual, Mr. Bikramjit Singh, who wasn't able to wear his religious, um, his religious attire because of the 2004 law in France. The Human Rights Committee in that case recognized the fact of, uh, I recognized the point of view of France. It recognized that France believes in this unique aggressive form of secularism called laicite and that there were some legitimate public safety, public order, and national security concerns that were associated with allowing all, they were associated with allowing certain parts of the human body to be covered by religious garb. The Human Rights Committee in this case considered the point of view of France. It recognized that France does subscribe to this more aggressive form of secularism known as laicite and that there are certain circumstances under which allowing people to wear, the relig to wear religious garb and enter public institutions could create some public order, public safety or national security concerns. However, it struck, it noted that this wasn't a proportionate response to this and that it wasn't justified to prohibit the use of these symbols altogether in the public at large. They said that in the specific case, this little boy had caused no palpable harm by wearing his religious garb and he was being condemned merely because of his membership to a specific group and not because of any other national security or public order reason. Another situation or another country where we see an aggressive form of secularism is the case of Turkey. Historically, the transition that Turkey has made from the Ottoman Empire to the modern state was characterized by the philosophy of Kemalism. Uh, Kemalism is a modernizing force. What Kemalism sought to do was to create a more secular modern Turkey, which was more akin to one of the Western countries that, were, that existed. What this entailed was the abolition of all religious orders, uh, the creation of a uniform civil code that would govern all civil interactions. And further, the introduction eventually in 1937 of secularism within the constitutional framework. Much has changed since Kemalism was um, prominent within Turkey. And today we see that there have been more conservative political elements that have come into force and that have um, uh, sort of made certain reforms take place within Turkey. Therefore, the question of secularism is now a far more complicated one. This question of uh, secularism, of aggressive secularism, much akin to the French version, came up under fire before the European Court of Human Rights in 2005 in the decision of Leila Sahin versus Turkey. Uh, Leila Sahin versus Turkey is a seminal decision. It's very well known and it's, it recognizes a lot of very important uh, areas associated with the law governing secularism within Turkey. What were the facts of that case? The applicant in that case, Leila Sahin, was a medical student who was uh, studying uh, in the University of Istanbul. She had completed four years of her course and in the fifth year of her course, uh, she was subjected to an administrative order of the university that prohibited any, um, uh, the, any sort of religious garb to be worn within the premises of the university. It was said within the administrative order that this could result in expulsion from the class, it could result in um, not permitting individuals to write exams and even a disciplinary action. The applicant, Leila Sahin, had worn a headscarf for the first four years of her education and she refused to not wear it later based on and relied on her religious freedom to do so. Uh, when disciplinary action was, uh, was initiated against her, Leila Sahin took this matter to the European Court. And uh, on these facts, an overwhelming majority, 16 to 1, held that the, the measures that were taken by Turkey were reasonable. Reference was made to the idea of laicite within Turkey, which is known as lake. And it was stated that countries should have a margin of appreciation in these sensitive areas of determining the relationship between religion and state. And therefore, Turkey should have the discretion to determine exactly how its secular policy plays out without there being any European supervision. It's interesting that the court pointed out that the reason why this margin of appreciation was being provided to Turkey was because there is so much disagreement across the world and within the European community about what the relationship between the state and religion should be. And therefore, there is no one applicable standard. It's important to refer to the one judge who did not subscribe to this opinion. The dissenting opinion of Tulkins contains a lot of um, important criticism of uh, the position of secular, the kind of secularism that's subscribed to by uh, countries that, like France. 
Tulkins looked at the definition of pluralism and said that while pluralism does have assimilative elements, what's more important is that it should be able to account for the different cultural backgrounds of individuals. So in a multicultural society, space must be given by the state for different individuals to exercise what's fundamental to them and uh, to exercise their freedom of religion consequently. Moreover, it's interesting that Tulkin looked specifically at whether the acts of Leila Sahin in wearing her headscarf had actually contra contravened secularism per se, or whether it was merely and simplistically just an exercise of a freedom of religion. And noting that there were no larger public security concerns, no national security issues, he pointed out that there was no tangible impact that her behavior was having on secularism within Turkey per se. So what about India? At this juncture, it becomes interesting to look into the provisions within India, look at the law in India, and see where India could be categorized on this spectrum of secularism. Secularism has an interesting and long history in India. During the nationalist movement, secularism has been seen by scholars as being used by leaders of the national movement to create a certain degree of political unity amongst the colonized. There were two prominent notions of secularism that have, had gained traction at that point. The first is the Gandhian notion of secularism, which subscribes to the idea that there is a certain degree of inherence of religion in human lives. Religion cannot be easily separated from civil society or from politics. And therefore, he believed in Sarva Dharma Sambhava, which is all religions should be permitted to prosper and should be accommodated within the <coughs> policies of any state. This um, theory achieved a lot of support within the Const Constituent Assembly. And many, many members of the Constituent Assembly, like K.M. Munshi, Mr. K.L. Metra, Mr. K.V. Kamath, in different debates adopted this approach and referred to the teachings of uh, Gandhi. The second notion that has gained prominence is in, in India is Nehruvian secularism. Uh, Professor Jacob de Ruva in uh, his work has analyzed what the main tenets of uh, Nehruvian secularism are. These include that religion is in fact a personal matter and not a public matter. Secondly, that there should be complete and total separation between the state and religion. Third, People should be provided complete religious freedom. And fourth, there must be equal opportunity. There's been great support uh, for this theory, which has been dubbed the no concern theory within the Constituent Assembly. And the proponents of this were, for instance, Mr. Tajamul Hussain and Mr. Katie Shah. Interestingly enough, uh, because of the divisions between the two groups in their understanding of secularism within the Indian polity, even though religion and secularism featured many times within the Constituent Assembly debates, the, movement to make, the move to make secularism a part of the Indian constitution or to make it part of the preamble was defeated by 68 votes to 41. And therefore, at the, creation, at the time of the creation of the constitution, secularism wasn't part of the preamble. However, on the other hand, we do see that religious freedom became a part of the constitution within Article 25. Uh, and Article 25 guarantees both the freedom of religious conscience as well as free profession of religion, practice and propagation. Later on, uh, the Constitution of India has been amended. Uh, after the decision in Keshav Nand Bharti and Indira Gandhi versus Raj Narayan, it was established that secularism does in fact lie at the foundation of Indian society and the Indian system of governance. And therefore, by the 42nd Amendment in 1976, uh, secularism was included into the preamble of the Indian Constitution. In SR Burmai versus Union of India, the Supreme Court confirmed the importance of secularism as a principle of accommodation and of tolerance as forwarded by Gandhiji and other national leaders. However, subsequently and uh, throughout the history of India, the interaction between this secularism and the laws that uh, provide for religious freedom have not been simple. Just to take one prominent example that has left a mark on Indian jurisprudence, the clash between secularism and religious laws is the decision of the Supreme Court in Shah Bano. Uh, in the absence of the UCC, India still uh, has religious personal laws that govern the field. In Shah Bano, the, uh, the petitioner in that case, Ms. Shah Bano, was given the irrevocable Muslim divorce uh, in 1968 by her husband. Uh, Shah Banu approached the courts and filed a petition for maintenance, but she did so under the Secular Criminal Procedure Code in Section 125. Her husband, however, given the, uh, the prevalence of religious personal laws, contested this and said that since they were in fact governed by Muslim law, what is the law in place is that he was only required to pay 
for maintenance during the period of iddat which is a three month period after the divorce when a muslim woman is not permitted to marry what we see here is a direct clash between a personal religious law and the right to religious freedom and a secular legislation the court in this case held that the crpc or the code of criminal procedure is a secular law that applies to everyone irrespective of their religious affiliation and therefore ms shabano was given the right to have maintenance um, under the uh, section 125 the aftermath of this case is extremely interesting the congress government at that time led by uh, rajiv gandhi passed a law to override the effect of the shabano decision uh, this was done under the muslim women Pre protection of rights on divorce act what this act did was that it reinforced the position existing in muslim law over the principles that existed in the secular crpc or the code of criminal procedure and the reason and the rationale for this was religious freedom and that individuals who have religious affiliations should be allowed to have their personal matters governed by their religious laws this decision of the legislature to pass this law was considered by the supreme court in daniel latifi and uh, the constitutionality of this decision or this legislation was challenged the court upheld the law but it sort of read down its effect the logic that the court employed was that the, the muslim law doesn't necessarily prohibit maintenance being provided beyond the period of iddat and so some sort of logical compromise was arrived between the two extreme positions however what we do see is that this is a great example of the clash between the two positions today we find that secularism continues to be an extremely complex question in india the first um, area where this is a problem follows from the shabano decision the decision in shabano was so controversial and had so many uh, consequences after its uh, passage so how is it that a uniform civil code can actually be arrived at we find that the uniform civil code is a directive principle of state policy and it it features in the mandate of several of the political parties that come into power so if this uh, is supposed to be reached then what does this mean for religious freedom and how can the different interests of religious groups be accommodated while still upholding the principle of freedom of religion uh, another area where secularism is very complicated still in india is in preserving religious freedom itself um state laws in india some states have passed laws called the religious freedom laws which in fact are anti conversion laws and uh, create reporting requirements for the conversion of one religion to another the stated objective of this is to preserve the freedom of religion because it was seen that uh, a lot of there were many forced conversions that were happening within the territory of india and the government wanted there to be a higher bar and some sort of state protection against this behavior however what we do see on the other hand is the question of what this means for uh, individuals who do want to out of good faith and out of their spiritual beliefs convert how does the how does the the system arrive at a balance between that right and the need for secular protective law finally we see that there are certain structural problems that scholars have pointed out with indian secularism a prominent one is the idea that even though the framework purportedly of the constitution is secular the agents that act within it aren't necessarily so a lot of political parties have stated religious affiliations and a lot of institutions that aren't political parties uh, but are organized in religious lines do have a large say in the making of indian um, legislative uh, legislative policy or executive policies and so the question that lingers is if there is this thick socio cultural consequence what does it mean for the the secular structure of india thank you